Hello everyone, good evening. How are we doing today? It's another Saturday, a very interesting one at that. You're welcome once again to the Start of Compliance series and I am none other but your host. I'm very grateful that you're part of the Start of Compliance session. So thank you so much for being here. Um, we're going to take one minute, um, just take some time to really get down to why we are here. Um, very, very important and very, very critical. We have a very important topic. So um, it's going to be very interesting. One of the very core and critical things that we do on this series is basically to talk and go over very important key ecosystem compliance and regulatory things that basically help startups whether they're in ideation, incubation, or just trying to get their product out there, go to market, to be able to just understand the regulatory framework and what exactly they try to do. So it's really, really great that, you know, we have this series and it's very important that we really do this. So I am very, very excited. I am super excited. I can see Gabriel. Thank you, Gabriel, for being here. I'm really, really glad to have you, you know, have this session with us. It's such an honor. Um, please, if you're here, introduce yourself, talk about what you do, where you're from, where you're watching us from, where you're joining us from. Um, I see that there are a lot of issues that have arisen recently, and so I'm happy that we are here just addressing some of these issues. Our guest is already in the room, and I'm super excited for him to you know, just speak. Um, but let's have more people, so let's take one more minute to uh, get more people in the room. I know it's an evening, everybody trying to you know, get themselves and just relax but you know come hang with us right so thank you um, Gabriel then you can just introduce yourself what you do and what are some of the things that you are looking out for you're looking for yes hello Chigoze Chikuma um, we see yes from YouTube thank you very much for joining me a digital lawyer practicing in Lagos fantastic thank you so much um, I see more people joining in thank you very much and I'm glad that you are here with us okay great so yes uh, like I said, my name is Rosemont Phil Osiwa. I am privileged to be um, the host for the Startup Compliance Series. The Startup Compliance Series basically is an online virtual event where we literally speak as to different subject matters. Um, this is the sixth in the series. So uh, for those of you that are joining in for the first time, you can join us or you can go through the past LinkedIn recordings or go on YouTube and see all we've talked about. We've talked about startup trends. We've talked about data privacy and policy. We've talked about things that have to do with funding. We've talked about corporate governors. We've talked about taxes, right? So um, it's very interesting that we are here. So without further ado, yes, I see Mirabel, you're very welcome. I see Coffrey Aquari, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. So very quickly, without further ado, it will be my honor and my privilege to introduce our guest. Our guest today is someone I really respect. Uh, I think we've known each other now for 10 years and counting, right? Um, he's doing fantastic, amazing work also in the startup ecosystem. And it's been incredible that, you know, he's actually, you know, coming to actually share his thoughts with us. So um, I'm very, very happy to have him here. And so once I read his profile, please, by all means, um, make, make sure that you are here, make sure you are listening, make sure that you are you know, just giving us some digital love in the manner of speaking, right? So before I bring him up, um, I'm going to be reading his profile very shortly. And I would love to present that profile because I think, I think it's very important that we do that. I hope I'm back on. I think something took me out. Okay. So let me uh, bring up our speaker first of all. Hello, Chiso. How are you doing? Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. Good evening, Rosemond. Glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I am just going to share. I think it's very important that, you know, I, I, I talk about, you know, what you do and the work you do. So permit me to um, just share. Of course. Just share, share, share your profile so that everyone can see it. So, yeah. Um, Chiso is the company secretary and legal counsel of Verify Me Nigeria Limited, which is a dynamic technology company that specializes in providing secure digital identity verification solutions. 
Prior to joining Verify Me, Chisum was a senior associate in Touchstone and Gray, a leading law firm in Nigeria where he worked with and led different teams in the firm, including the employment law team. At Verify Me, Chisum oversees the legal and compliance and corporate governance activities of the company. By combining his wealth of litigation and transaction experience, Chisum demonstrates a special competence in guiding the company to navigate evolving risks prevalent in its business and implement An award winning international employment law resource for legal and HR professionals published by Squire Cartoon Blog London. In addition, he has contributed to various doing business and employing workers reports published by the World Bank Group. That's super amazing. It's super amazing having you here. So, welcome again, Chisum. So good to have you. Thank you. Thank you for spending your evening with us at the Cyber Compliance Series. It's so exciting. Um, I remember our uh, several banters uh, talking about a lot of things. And, you know, when I thought about this topic and, you know, we were talking about it, and there was something I said on LinkedIn, for those of you, you know, who go there a lot, there was something I said. I said, if I had a dollar for every time I have had employees, especially upset and angry employees, complain to me and talk about how they've been treated in their places of work, whether it's a startup or it's a fully... Um, formed and fully mature company, I would literally be able to buy myself some pricey assets because there's been a lot of challenges. Mm. So I'm glad that we're going to be speaking this. Absolutely. I know we have, exactly, I know we have practitioners in the room, we have lawyers, we have, you know, I think startup people are co-founders, so I'm very excited about this, right? So the topic, let's go straight to it, right? Um, the topic basically is employment law compliance, um, you know, when we talk about employment law, what do we really mean? I would love to, you know, get that, get, first of all, just set that foundation, set that ground down. What do we really mean when we talk about employment law and employment law compliance? It would be great to know that. Okay, so when, when you talk about employment law, um, well, basically employment law compliance, you, you were talking about the entire system um and uh, that in terms of laws regulations practices standards and um even established practices really that make up the entire employment arrangement or employment system in the workplace now for startups especially it's a it's a very interesting or very sensitive issue because startups really mostly have their people so Employment compliance is something that I believe um, every startup needs to take very seriously. And I guess in the course of the discussion, I'll be able to address all of them one by one. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? Fantastic. So yes, thank you for that. So, so when we talk about employment law, uh, basically we're talking about the regulations or the rules that govern the space. So how employees are onboarded or how what the laws that literally govern the relationship maybe between employees and their employer. So can you walk us through, right, um, some of these you know, labor laws and the regulations that basically you know, help us, you know, understand first of all we need to know what the laws are first of all so can you you know what are those laws basically and then uh, you know how do they help us basically okay thank you very much okay um employment law is um you know what before i start let me because this is it, it, it's a really interesting topic for me so before i start yeah. i'd like to start with a story or rather a case actually a live case so sometime in 2015, there was this gentleman, his name is Mr. Akondi. And he was working with a hotel at the time, and he saw a public advertisement uh, regarding if they can see in another company. Of course, the man wanted better opportunities, so he applied for the role. And the company invited him for an interview. He went through the entire recruitment process. And 
the company actually sent him an offer letter on the 29th of October 2015. On the 30th, that is the next day, this gentleman responded and said and accepted the offer of employment. Naturally, this means he's starting a new role. He's starting based on the salary and the understanding that they have. So one month later, on November, in November 2015, this gentleman, Mr. Conde, gets to the workplace. And at arri on arriving at the workplace, they told him, oh, that the company has decided to go in a different direction, that they are no longer interested in hiring him and they are withdrawing the offer. At this point, this man has already resigned from his workplace. So, of course, <laughs> he's aggrieved. He goes to court at his use. And then at that point, the court says no, that the employer cannot at that point actually make offers and then simply resolve from the same offer that it has made at its own um, will at, at any time. That employers actually have an obligation to act in good faith, reasonably and fairly at all times. So at that particular point, and in that particular case, what the court now did was to explain that there are three categories of rights to which individuals are entitled. Now, the first is the pre-employment rights. Now, these are rights that I, um, exist as at the time that the individual is an applicant, like what you have in the case of this Mr. Conde. Uh, at that time, he's not, he wasn't an employee, but the court recognized that he has certain rights. So the second phase of rights is the right that exists for as, um, as an employee. So with, uh, those are the rights that you find in the contract of employment, in laws and regulations and the rest of them. And then the third rights are those that you call the post-employment rights, now rights such as you know, your access to your pension and the rest of them. Now, with this in mind, the, the, <laughs> so the, the different phases of employment have different laws, have different regulations, have different practices or standards that apply to them. So now in Nigeria, for instance, the employment law in Nigeria is not really founded on the provisions of a single law. Now, they are actually spread across different laws. Of course, the main one that people know being the Labor Act. However, of course, there is still a discussion here and there as to whether the Labor Act applies to professionals and all that, but that's a discussion for another day. So because, but in most cases, you find that the court tends to, re to refer to the Labor Act as the minimum standard to adopt in certain circumstances or in most employment circumstances. So the Labor Act, like you know, provides and address issues of uh, employment contracts, wages, annual leave, sick leave, redundancy, maternity leave, and the rest of them. Now, like I said, the Labor Act is what we consider the key law in terms of employment compliance. Now, there are several other laws that apply to employment relationships, such as the Nigerian Data Protection Regulation. Um, fortunately, last week, you had discussions on that um, regulation. Now, here's how it employ applies to employment and employees as well. Now, like the speaker in that session must have mentioned, now, data subjects are individuals. They're human beings who, whose um, information, who's, who can be identified using specific information. Now, that means that employees are also data subjects. Now, employees who are also data subjects are entitled to the same rights of privacy and rights to um, data protection that is laid down in the Nigerian Data Pro um, Regulation, which is where this regulation comes in and which is why I needed to mention it. And beyond the employee themselves or the employees themselves, even the relationship of the employees and maybe the customers and the clients or even the company itself, there are factors of data protection that come in at one point or the other. Now, another regulation that also applies to employment relationships uh, the, is the National Housing Fund Act. Now, the National Housing Fund Act really relates to certain deductions and remittances that have to be made in uh, by organizations, both private and public organizations. However, in the past, it used to apply to private and public organizations. However, now, by virtue of the Business Facilitation Miscellaneous Provisions Act of 2022, it now, it seems to now be optional for private entities while it remains mandatory for public entities. So for that, it provides that um, companies are required to, for employees that are earning above the national minimum wage, that they are required to contribute 2.5% of their monthly income to the fund that is established pursuant to that act. Now, there is also the Pension Reform Act, which we know very well, which of course requires employees to 
contribute ten percent of the employee's um, salary and also have the employee contribute eight percent of their of their salary as well, which is remitted to the employee's retirement savings account. Now, the Pension Reform Act really gives the employee employer sorry the opportunity to take on that entire responsibility to remit. Um, to take responsibility for the entire pension. That is both the employer and the employee's con um, contribution. But then I feel like the part where they may not have considered it very well is because they said that in that case, the employer will have to contribute a minimum of 20% of the employee's salary. So of course, naturally, nobody will want to take on more responsibilities when if you deduct from the employee, you remit 18%. So if I want to say I want to bear it for myself, it should at least be equal to or less than 18 percent but i'm going too far so now um that remittance to the um, retirement savings account what is the pension reform act also provides it's that um if within six months of the employment the employee does not open a retirement savings account the employer actually has an obligation to open a nominal retirement savings account for the employee and then remit the pension into that account so also the Pension Reform Act as well provides for, uh, requires employers to take out what you call a group life insurance. Now the group life insurance policy in favor of each employee is supposed to be for a minimum of three times the annual total emoluments of that employee. So under the Pension Reform Act, you have you know, pension and group life insurance. Then there is the Employee Compensation Act, <clears throat> which establishes the employee compensation fund. Now, the purpose of this fund is actually to provide for compensation to employees or their dependents if they're in the event of any death, injury, disability, or disease arising out of or in the course of their employment. So for that, the Employee Compensation Act requires the employer to make a minimum monthly contribution to the into the employee compensation fund. In event of, yes, of an accident, sorry, I thought I lost the letter for a bit. In event of an accident, the employee can actually apply to receive certain compensation from that fund. As well um, is also the industrial training fund. Now, section six of industrial training fund, which of course has also been adjusted by the business employers having um, 25% establishment and not operating within a trade free trade zone is required to contribute 1% of its total annual payroll every year to the industrial training fund. Now, what you find is, of course, a lot of companies don't really know of these things or they don't really comply until there is time to, it's time for enforcement or something. You know. But um, also, another law that really applies to employees is the um, Personal income tax, yeah. which has to deduct from employee one. salaries or emoluments to the relevant tax authorities. <laughs> so yes, and then um, so I mean there are several laws, like I said. So if I keep going into all of them, we will spend the day there. But there is also the Immigration Act that relates to um, companies that want to employ foreign employees. So in that case, of course, there are requirements for you to obtain an extra trade quota for those foreign employees. Okay. And then there are other laws as well, like the, the Factories Act, Trade Disputes Act, Trade Unions Act, and also by virtue of the um, alteration of the, the Constitution, Section 254C of the Constitution, um, and the National Industrial Court is now allowed to uh, adopt conventions, international best practices, which of course can be found in conventions and some other, other standards, you know. And finally, of course, case law. The National Industrial Court has exclusive jurisdiction in all things labor. So it only makes sense that you look at the decisions of the court, like I would do because of our discussions, to look at the standards that the court has laid down or the changes or the radical changes that the National Industrial Court has introduced in the employment um, ecosystem or atmosphere really. That, I guess I'll just stop there for now. That's so, the first thing I want to say is that's a lot of laws, right? Like, where do we even start Absolutely. from? Absolutely. So, 
Yeah, and you know, I think it's important that we, first of all, like we actually know that these laws are there. Because it's so amazing the ignorance that, you know, actually exists. Because a lot of people do not even know that they have this right. A lot of companies do not know that they are compelled or they are obligated to permit some of these things. Like, for example, you've already mentioned the fact that, you know, you have to remit a particular percentage the moment, you know, you are earning above minimum wage. So, while you were speaking, mm -hmm. right, two questions came to my mind, but I'm going to summarize them in one. Do this act and these laws, do they need to, because we're talking about startups, right? Um, I don't know if, if yes. of course, depending on the stage and the level at which these startups already exist and all, my question is, are all these laws applicable to startups? If no, right? Which are the ones that are very important? Because, for example, you work in a startup. You work, I don't. I wouldn't call you guys a startup anymore. Anyway, you guys are like big boys now, so, <laughs> right? But you, but you play in a in a primarily technologically driven startup space. Do you guys do all these yeah. things? And if yes, um, what does mm -hmm. it? What the process? What what's the What's the implementation framework that you've been able to work with? Because you've mentioned so many things, the pension reforms act, you know, the ID, all those funds and all those things. So how do we work around it? How should a startup think about these laws? How should they get ready to implement? How do they start the process? Especially if they have, it's something they've not even considered at all. Because that's even why we are here. So yeah, I would love you to answer that. <laughs> so interestingly, this conversation, Conversation, this question that you just asked now is the question is is something a lot of startups say because once you mention all these things they're like ah, ah we're a startup now where are we supposed to find the money so but unfortunately what you find is that majority of these laws were made over 30 40 years ago and you know 20 years ago and they did not envisage the environment that we have now Unfortunately, you find that a lot of them really do not make any exclusions because maybe so. Look at some of these um, some of these laws I just talked about. Their idea of startups or their idea of maybe small companies. Then we are companies that have less than twenty five employees, less than three employees. Now you see, compared to startups, startups are always trying to scale, trying to employ people who are going to help them grow their business quickly. So you hardly even find startups that have less than three, less than 10, sometimes less than 25. You can see startups that have as much as 50, 60, 70 employees because they need to get things going as quickly as possible. So unfortunately, I cannot advise anybody not to comply with <laughs> those regulations. But I do understand that that is what the Startup Act really was trying to achieve because it tries to establish a system that harmonizes these laws to look at what, what and what startups can really get to, you know, comply with and maybe waive, given the fact that they are actually um, growing at that stage. But, well, until actually we have that set down and in force, then um, we have to obey the law as is. It is what it is, you know, as we I say. Was even, it is what it is, right? I was even going to say mm. that the truth is, because, like you, re like you rightly mentioned, most of these laws were incorporated a very long time ago. Like, if you go and read some of the RGBC, absolutely. Thing. So you literally have to understand that, you know, as dynamic and as innovative as you are, you are actually and predominantly in a space that the rules are trying to catch up with you, right? So I think for me, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. to add to some of the things you've mentioned, the first step you can take is to have an implementation framework as far as compliance is concerned. And this, like you've mentioned, Absolutely. Right, you know, I think it's responsibility for you as a startup or as a startup advisor to say, look, oh, guys, um, I know that you people don't want to hear any more laws, but you need to pay attention to what this is, what this is, and how we can start the implementation. So that leads me to my next question mm -hmm. on this issue of the laws and governance. I think so that we're already 24 minutes in. Wow. Is how do you manage yeah. implementation within your own company or from your experience? And if you're going to advise a professional who is actually a player in this space and is working with startups that literally, you know, have these challenges of ignorance and do not have implementation under their belt. How would you advise them to start getting ready to, you know, comply with some of these things that the law you know, requires? So one of the first things that I will advise, of course, it goes without saying, work with a lawyer. 
um, who will be in a position, a startup lawyer who is conversant with all these laws, who will be able to advise you on the, the laws that are applicable to you and the timelines for compliance. So basically, you have to establish what a compliance schedule to know when anything is due and for you to comply. That is one. Second is planning. So if you look at a lot of these laws that I have mentioned, you will realize that a lot of them flow from employee salaries, employee monuments. So it comes from budgeting. If you're going to say you want to hire somebody, I want to pay them a particular amount, you have to consider that this amount, based on that amount, you will now have to add tax, you have to add pension, you have to add you know, some of the other contributions that are required to do by law so that when you are creating an, a budget for salaries and all that, because a lot of sal startups, you hear that their salaries are really high. So what some of them really do is when it is time to pay salaries, all they really think about is the main salary itself. But then by the time you are looking at the excesses that they did not remit, and the thing about compliance is that the more you postpone it, the worse it gets. So if, for instance, in the first month, your remittance obligations were about, three million and by the time you're at the 10th month you're looking at 30 million and by the time you're at you know um, end of the year you're looking at 36 million so it all comes into planning as to how you allocate your resources and it is usually better for you to comply at the time it is due so that you don't wait for the moment where regulators are coming after you or sending notice requests or, or demands and the rest of them so it all comes down to establishing a system that works that allows you to know and track your obligations and also um, comply with them as an NG. I love I love what you said about you know being able to set that framework. I, I think it's a beautiful way of just explaining how to set a framework, right? Budget, anticipate mm. and plan. And it's true what you said. It gets worse at the more you. The, that's why you know the government they will not come. They'll just be watching you when you now need something. That's exactly when they will not say, where is, where is that, where is that? And they're running Elta Skelter and penalties are chasing you like, you know, something that you don't want to have chased, right? So thank you very much. So let's go to the next mm -hmm. part of this. Um, I would love to know. So you've talked, so I think you've even answered the question that I was going to ask, which is, you know, best practices. But let's look at two things, right? Some of the best practices yes. that you have seen in managing employment relationships. And, you know, I know you shared a story, so it's great to hear quite a few of your stories. And what are some of the major <laughs> employment policies, right? What are some of the major employment policies that startups should actually have? You know, it would be very, very good to actually, you know, address them quickly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, I, it's unfortunate that we don't have time, but I will try to cover as much as I can. So, like, I remember when I started, I talked about free employment rights and in terms of best practices, you also have to consider them from the pre-employment stage. Now, at this point, the em employment due diligence is something that people don't really talk about so much, but employment verification is a very important aspect of every employment relationship. Why? Because you need to know the kind of person you're employing, you need to conduct background checks to be able to confirm several information, so like, such as the employment history, their credentials, their guarantors, the verification, and all that. Now, it allows you to know, first of all, that the employee that, you, that you're bringing into your company is free from any maybe baggage or load. You need to even understand why they're, they are trying to leave where they are or why maybe they were terminated from their previous employments to even join you in the first place. And I'll explain why this is important. One, for fintech, for example, financial institution, banks, financial institution, the Central Bank of Nigeria has what you call a black book. Now, this black book is like a register that containing the names of employees whose employment were terminated or dismissed for um, misconduct relating to fraud, dishonesty, corruption, and the rest of them. Now, the reason the CDN established that is so that you don't have the same people that were dismissed for this reason going around the financial system. So imagine committing fraud in one company and then before you know it, you just get into another job into another company. So that black book is one. Now, second is restrictive covenants. So you find that in the course it, in, in the startup system, a lot of people, there is a lot of disclosure of confidential information, trade secrets, and um, uh, intellectual property and all that. So you find that a lot of times when people execute employment contracts, they insert clauses that restrict employees from maybe engaging in certain trade or joining a competitor within a particular time frame. So those are the kind of due diligence that you need to check 
at the time that the employee is, is joining you. So you need to ask really specifically if they are bound by any restrictive covenants because there has been a particular case where a company employed an individual and the other individual, the previous employer, realized that the employee was actually in breach of the restrictive covenant that was agreed in the employment contract. So they went to court. Wow. And actually the court found that there was a breach of that clause and all that determination of the employment between that employee and the employer as well. Again, um, another factor to consider in due diligence is, of course, like I mentioned, data protection. So now that we have technology, we are able to access different data sets involving employees and all that. But again, we must always find a way to balance data protection and employee background checks. So to move on from that, really, there are several things that we need to consider at the point that we're commencing an employment relationship, which of course, key of them being the employment contract. The reason, normally employment can sometimes be inferred by conduct, but it is always best to have an employment contract because even the labor act and practices require you to have an employment contract between yourself and the employee. So your employment contract must contain information related to the employee, position, date of engagement, nature of engagement, terminating notice, which I will address subsequently, and any other special terms or conditions applying to the contract. So now for me, what I would advise for startups, because of the peculiar nature of the business and the peculiar nature of startups, I would advise that the following also be considered as part of the onboarding documents that the company should um, adopt. One, of course, being the know your employee form. Now, this is like a KYC, really, of the employee. So get all the information that you need for ease of administration of you know, the employment obligations and the rest of them. Again, in um, preparing that KYC form for employees, you must also remember the data minimization obligation as made down in the NDPR, which means you must not collect more information than you need. The information you want to collect must be specific and useful for the purpose for which you're collecting them. Now, um, I'm sure in, at the previous session, you must have also discussed the importance of a data processing consent form for the employees, because like I said, employees are data subjects as well. So you need to be able to give, so you need to share with them a form detailing what you will use their personal data from for and also have them give their consent to that. Now to the more important ones, of course, you can, you should at any point you're commenting an employment relationship, you should have a, a, a non-disclosure agreement by the side. That one, you should go together with the employment contract, really. Because of course, as a startup, like I said, you're disclosing a lot of confidential information, trade secrets and you know even some of your investors information as well to the employees so you don't want this information to be mismanaged as well because if your employee breaches certain confidentiality obligations it might also turn around to affect you the startup as a company and also expose you to liability from third parties and others as well so again you must also consider that your employment contract should also contain very important intellectual property assignment clause so thought that you ensure that the company is the owner of every intellectual property created in the course of that employment so that there is no dispute in the future as to whether that intellectual property or that asset belongs to the employee or any other thing. So again, there is also the employee handbook. I'll talk about that subsequently and the other company policies which you must give to the employee at the commencement of the employment relationship because you need the employee to know the terms and the conditions for way that govern the employment relationship. Now, for startups, of course, most startups, you find out that people are working hybrid, people work from home, and people work from different locations. Of course, in the past, it used to be desktops and all that, and it's in the office, and everybody has to come and sit down. But now you find that you're giving people devices to use. So you have to maybe to have, um, give the employee a device acknowledgement form. Now, what that form should normally do is to detail the device that you're giving the employee, and also, you know, to several information relating to that device and even the condition at which it was issued to the employee. So you find that for tech, for instance, a lot of them use really expensive devices like MacBooks and all that. So and you find that before you know it, a careless employee will damage it. And then you start asking, okay, how was it when, it, when we gave it to you? What happened and all that? So this is that. And also this device acknowledgement form is also important for when the employment is about to end and you're trying to get back the properties that you have given to the employee, so you even didn't have something to show. So that is one. So I'll move on to employment employee handbook. Employee handbook is 
the law, the Nigerian courts, of course, have recognized that the employment contract is really just a few pages of contracts, is really, and cannot really contain all the provisions that you require to govern the employment relationship. Now, the court, all the court or then the law also appreciates that an employer has the right to set up the terms and conditions that will govern the workplace. So that is why employers have that freedom to set up employer handbook. And even though it is not contained in that three pages or four pages employment contract, the law considers it as part of the terms and conditions. However, it doesn't give you the liberty to go and insert provisions that are unfair or excessive. And you can then say that just because that it is in the employment handbook, the law will never enforce the provision if it is unfair. Why? Because the law understands that there is inequality in bargaining power between the employer and the employee, which means that the employee actually has little or no contribution to the drafting of the employment handbook, which means that when you're bringing it before the court to say, I want to enforce this provision, one of the first things that the court will look at is look at the facts, look at the national best practice and consider whether that provision in itself is fair. And the courts will never ever uphold any provision that constitutes what may be referred to as an unfair labor practice. So in terms of what your employee handbook should normally address, there, there's a lot of things that really it should address that I, that I cannot even exhaust it in this discussion as well. But just to highlight a few, your employee handbook should really cover matters relating to probation. Of course, in the employment contracts you will address, you will probably have to reflect the specific period of the probation, but there are other things that you need to address as well. Because in certain instances, you find that if at the end, the probation period is really a period where the employer and the employee assess each other to confirm if you know they're fit, if they can work together and all that. And what's supposed to happen uh, is that at the end of the probation period, either you terminate the probation, you extend the probation, or um, sorry, either you terminate the employment or you extend the probation just to assess the employee a bit further. So all those kind of things. So on that probation, you need to also make sure that you track the timeline because there have been instances where um, the em employee's probation period end and ends and the company does not say anything. So if the employee continues to work for a prolonged period, you cannot now come back and say that, yo, this person is still on probation and I want to take action against, or, or I want to take a decision one way or another. Now, what the court is going to say is that there was an implied confirmation of employment since the probation period ended and you did not say anything. Now, other things that you also need to consider in the handbook are issues related to performance management as well. So you need to um, look at periodic appraisals because, especially for startups, you always want people who are up and doing, people who are adding value to the company. So that means that if you want to terminate an employment for on performance, performance basis, then what the court will have to look at is whether you actually did assess the performance of the employee whether you give the employee, uh, the employee perhaps an opportunity to even improve. So it is based on that that the court will say, okay, fine, this person's performance was really poor. There was an appraisal and, you know, and that determination, it makes sense in that context. Mm -hmm. So other things that you need to cover in your handbook are issues related to confirmation, promotions, bonus, suspension, disciplinary proceedings, you know, leave. These days you find people, you know, giving paternity leave in their employment handbook as well. You know, maternity leave, you yeah. cover that. That is also laid down in the Labor Act, of course. Then there are other um, facts, uh, issues that you also need to address, such as, you know, post-termination obli post obligations, resignation, harassment, bullying, and the rest of them. So let me get to, now that is the handbook. So you can have the policies I'm about to mention. You can have them as part of the handbook, but usually I suggest that it is separate documents for a few reasons. You don't want the handbook to be too bulky so that it's difficult for people to read. If there are factors that you can address in isolation, then do so. Because also when you try to establish relationship with certain other certain counterparties, you realize that they ask you for some of these documents. You will find that especially in the finance sector or the tech sector, you realize the way you want to establish relationship with maybe banks, financial institutions, they will always ask you for certain policies to show that in your company itself that you are compliant with the requirement requirements and even all that general legal requirements. So one of them is the whistleblower policy. Now, the purpose of this policy really is to give the employees obligation, or both the obligation and the opportunity to be able to report any potential 
um, or ongoing misconduct or fraud or maybe any crime of any nature in the company. So, but in addition to giving the employees the opportunity to report those things, the whistleblower policy also provides to protect the employee that is making the report from any form of victimization or harassment or, you know, or any, well, adverse effects of making the report. Of course, the white whistleblower policy must also provide for things like punishing people who want to make false allegations because, well, human beings will be human beings. So that is one. So again, you also have your anti-bribery and corruption policy, which, well, I guess it's explanatory, but it is important to have those provisions because of course, you know, bribery and corruption is a criminal offense, but it's also important because it allows you, the company and your employees to act and consider things objectively because you also get to address matters like gate policy. You'll be able to place limits on maybe the amount that employee can really receive or give out to third parties so that it does not create an impression of bribery or corruption, or it doesn't put the company in a position where the integrity of the company is questioned as well. Then another one is the anti-money laundering policy. This you'll find mostly in the finance industry, but the anti-money laundering act in itself really requires this policy to exist and mentions a lot of companies that should really comply with the act and also should have this policy. So what this really does is to impose several obligations like you know the due diligence obligation KYC and several other things that are highlighted in it. So again, we live in a tech, we live in, a, um, in an age where people can, are able to access social media at any time and you know, write everything that they can. However, sometimes you find that there is a very thin line between an individual and their work. So for example, when you hear of certain things, certain maybe sexual harassment cases, or you hear um, maybe people being racist, you hear them mention that person's role, for instance. The CEO of this company said this. The chief risk officer of this person's company said this. So in that thing, in that context, they might drive in the company. Now, the, the purpose of the social media policy is not to restrict how employees communicate. It's not to restrict their right to expression or freedom of expression. It's really to regulate how much they involve the company, how much they can involve or maybe mention the company's matters on social media as well. So you find that sometimes when you see some people's profiles, you see them write things like um, the views expressed on this page are mine only. That it's a very deliberate provision because sometimes it's to ensure that you don't mix up the person's um, thoughts with that of the company. So that's really what social media addresses. Remote working policies, now we, almost everybody will have been working from home for over two years. So, which means that, and when people work from home, you find that the, the risk of disclosure of confidentiality or data security risk or disclosure of or mismanagement of company information is likely to happen because of the people that come into your house and leave your house. So you want to be able to manage the terms of the remote part of the um, on which the employee works from home. So and this is not to re, um, restrict their rights, but it is just to say this is what you're allowed to do in terms of the company's um, property, in terms of the company's documents. When you're done with work, put it away. If some companies' policies really allow you to work from anywhere in the world, some policies allow you to work from home, but they require you to be in the same state. And they ask you, okay, if you're going to leave the state, please let us know. And if you see some people's policies, they also put a particular timeline, maybe in one month in a particular year, you're allowed to work in any country that you want. So those are the things that remote work policies address. Again, information security policy is something that's also very important because you know, you, a lot of people work on their laptops. There are possibilities of people installing software that might be harmful. You know, it also allows employees to be conscious of their cybersecurity um, obligations, you know, to bring to draw to their knowledge and attention what is expected of them to be able to protect the company's infrastructure. Because a, a, one, one, a, a mistake from one employee can really expose the entire company. Because if you use company emails on a daily basis, you see emails that come in some of them go to junk some of them enter your emails and uh, you see people sending you links to click on them now it only takes one employee to click on that link before one person can um assess the entire information of the company and let me give an example of a matter that um i was involved a couple of years ago so there is this there was this company and um 
what had happened, of course, they sent instructions. They were communicating with a counterparty on a particular contract. And as at the point this communication was ongoing, the hacker was already on the system. And you know hackers just join your, enter your system and they lay low. And they're just reading your emails until it's time. So these parties were exchanging information, exchanging communication, until it got to a point where the counterparty requested for an invoice. That was where the hacker stepped in, cut off the CEO of the company, sent an invoice. In fact, actually, the CEO of the company had sent an invoice initially, but the, the, the hacker then cut off the CEO of the company. Then we sent an invoice and said, oh, sorry, this invoice was a mistake. Please send the, send the money to this account. The other party sent an email and said, um, this looks like a different account. The person responded and said, um, don't worry, this is their account. It's the same account. Just proceed. It's, it's for the company. And then the counterparty sent the money. So the minor difference was an I in the original email and the fake email. So <laughs> it was an I. So the, 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 the oh. fake email that was sending that. So and by the time the, the owner of the email came back and was sending to the, an email to the counterparty to say, um, please, I have not received any payment from you. My email went off for a couple of days. Can you confirm if you have paid? And that was where every problem starts. Of course, the matter ended up in the police. Everybody's pointing fingers. The bank was even dragged into the matter. So these are things that information security policies address so that if anybody breaches them, you know how to hold. Also, the NDPR as well, like I said, also makes certain provisions and requirements that you need to comply with in terms of data protection and management. So you need to have a data protection and management policy to enlighten employees on how they should manage personal data that is processed in the company. For example, my, my company, we conduct data verification. So basically, we, we, we process data on a daily basis. So it is very important. And even the NDPR requires that you conduct trainings for your employees um, frequently. So also get them to bring, to get them to understand the obligations and also to protect the company as well. Because if you really Google the kind of sanctions that companies have fair, fixed, faced in terms of data breach, you will screen. Then... The maybe let me just mention this last one before like, I move on is the health and safety policy. Of course, every company has an obligation to provide a safe and secure working environment for employees. Um, and this, of course, gets down to several things. Now, there is the obligation, excuse me, there is the obligation of the company to the employees to provide a safe and secure work environment. But then even on the horizontal level, horizontal level that employs employee, employee. So you see that an employee who is not trained on health and safety practices really by the company is likely to also expose another employee to risks. Of course, who will be sued is the company. So these are the things that one really needs to, um, to consider in putting together the policy and the entire structure to which the company is um, it's for to which employees and employee employees are required to comply. So let me pause there before uh, so that wow, we can take any comments. Wow, wow. I think my head is my head is oh my god, wow. Wow, wow, and wow. That's all I can say. That's a that's a lot of information. That's a lot of relevant information because there's absolutely <laughs> nothing you are right now that can be dispensed with. So my advice for everyone right now watching. I'm not sure you got, you heard everything. You heard it, but you did not hear it. You have to go back and literally hear this again because <sighs> there are so many things. You know, like I say, it's not just about employing staff. You need to understand that the people you are bringing into your organization, there is so much that goes on into the project mm. beyond just saying I'm paying the salary, right? Absolutely. So even, I, I, remember a, I remember a typical example where I think there was supposed to be a back and forth between a company and another. And what happened was, I think there were email communications and there was an instruction to send emails to all the members of their subsidiaries and the company and all. Guess what? This person, mm. instead of blind copying, copied everybody. So you had over close to 350, <laughs> I don't know if it was 350,000, 300, if it was 350,000, I would have heard it in the news because it was so bad. Copied everybody, and everybody was wow. seeing everybody's information. That sparked a data mm -hmm. issue in the organization. In fact, I think at the end of the day, it went to court, but they had to settle out of court, 
and pay damages and all that. It was really, really mm -hmm. terrible. And I'm glad that you mentioned the issue as regards several policies that you need to have independent of just the employee handbook. So the, I, I look at the employee handbook like the constitution of the company, right? What are some of the things to expect Absolutely. as an employee in this company? And, but those policies now come, take what the law says, and applies it in terms of how the company approaches it, right? And I think it's very important to have. Mm -hmm. You've touched on so much, and we are already 10 minutes to an hour, and we've it's just, <laughs> it's wow. Guys, if you have your questions, yeah. please put them in. Obviously, we cannot touch, like, seriously, if we pick one policy and distill it, it will take an hour. So we can definitely not finish everything right now, but I just want to say thank you so much, Isom, for just really, just really going deep, doing such a very big, deep dive into this. I mean, really, really appreciate this. All right. So oh. I want to ask, because we have we, 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 we have about you know, 15 minutes to go before we move to the questions, right? I want you to talk about yes. what are some of the, unfair, the, some of the unfair labor practices that you've seen and what are some of the tips you would give to startup owners to foster a safe, um, diverse, and, of course, inclusive workplace culture? You know, and in, when you're talking about that, you know, um, I want you to touch on regard collaboration because um, different startups have different ways at which they onboard their employees. Some have HR departments that are dedicated to that purpose. Some have HR practitioners and some lawyers even double as HR practitioners. So this question basically is wanting to know, one, what are some of the unfair labor practices that you have seen and you think startups should really just put to an end? Two, what are some of the tips you give to us to you know, foster a safe and good workplace culture? And then what are some of the advice you have for HR professionals and lawyers? Because I know some of us are on this call before we move to you know, the last aspect yes. of uh, yeah. the session. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, <laughs> unfair labor practice really covers a whole lot of um, practices. But in summary, it is um, they are really referred to as practices that do not Confirm, conform with best practices in labor circles, as may be enjoyed by local and international experience, no standards, practices, and the rest of them. So what I'm just going to do is that I'm going to highlight just a couple of, um, of acts, really, you know, we're talking about do's and don'ts, that have been considered as unfair labor practices. Now, one of them is a very important thing that you find, because startups, you realize that, of course, the CEOs, the executives, they're under a lot of pressure. They're trying to grow a company. They have no patience for mediocrity. They have no patience for any misconduct or the rest of them. But then the law has a requirement that you need to follow procedure. Now, so it, that's why in terms, of, um, in terms of misconducts, you find that the law requires that, first of all, fair hearing is a very is a right that is guaranteed by the Nigerian constitution, and you cannot dodge it. So if you are alleging that an employee is engaged in any form of misconduct, then you have an obligation to engage, um, to really um, take the employee through a disciplinary process where the employee is given an opportunity to, to be heard. So, and that hearing really does not necessarily need to be um, oral with you calling witnesses. You can also be invited in the form of a query. But what is, what is most important is that one, you need to give the, opportunity, the employee an opportunity to be heard. That is very important. Then another one is in terms of workplace discrimination on account of gender, sex, and the rest of them. Of course, there was a... Initiative or something. Oh, he was disengaged because she was pregnant, and the company, of course, felt like okay, this person is not going to be contributing so much, and they laid her off while she was pregnant. And of course, she filed an action in court for um, you know breach of her fundamental rights. And the court actually held in our favor and held that there is no reason why the company should discriminate against employees for the, an employee for the mere reason that she's pregnant. And the same thing even goes for people with HIV among us, especially if the person's medical condition has absolutely nothing to do with the employee's ability to execute their duties. Now, another thing you also commonly find in companies is what you call constructive dismissal. Now, constructive dismissal is something that occurs where an employee resigns because an employer's behavior has become intolerable or heinous or so bad and the employer has made life so difficult for the employee that the employee has no choice but to resign. It's a constructive dismissal. Now, it's also constructive dismissal also applies where the employer creates working conditions or changes the terms of employment in a way that um, frustrates the employee into resigning. 
Now, the employer, it also happens where the employer makes life extremely difficult for the employee to attempt to, um, to, attempt to have the employee to resign instead of, you know, outrightly ending the employment relationship. So, you know, let me just use um, a, a, common, a common incident that happens. You know how you're in, when you're in somebody's house and the person starts to behave anyhow, and you start to feel like, okay, maybe so it's like, I'm no longer welcome here. Absolutely. So in those kind of situations, what the law now says is that now this, the essence of this constructive, this issue of constructive dismissal really speaks to the need to create an inclusive, a safe working environment for employees and to also encourage the compliance with the provisions you know, of the employment contract. And there is something that you also commonly find in certain employment contracts where, sorry, not employment contracts, some companies where they ask employees to resign. Sometimes some of them are done in good faith. Sometimes some of them are not. But in either case, the court has held all of them to amount to wrongful termination. That's constructive dismissal. And the court has also awarded damages against the company for doing that. So please never, ever employ an, um, in court, tell an employee to resign because they can kind of turn around to sue you. In fact, in a particular situation, the employee was very smart and she wrote in her resignation letter, the company has advised me to resign. So I hereby tender my resignation. She tendered it. She went to court and sued and she won. So those are some of the wow. things that one should ordinarily consider. Exactly. So sometimes one thing I have seen is that sometimes employees are very brilliant. They're not fools. So sometimes even in communication towards the end of the relationship and they haven't set an exchange with you on email, they are building a case and they're right. That is not to say the employee's case, the employee has that right. So what you have to do, and like this is what you also uh, encourage a lot of people that exit counseling is pointless. Have those reviews in the course of the employment relationship so that you will understand if there is any risk that the company is likely to face. And one thing that people really don't appreciate enough is that the misconduct of a line manager, of a superior officer, can also lead to liability for the company in itself. So do you find situations where employees in the company may be engaged in actions such as sexual harassment and or bullying and harassment? And at the end of the day, they sue both the manager, um, him or herself, and to, together with the company. So if you don't, and like you know very well, this is the reason that corporate governance really encourages or sets up these reporting lines that starts from the board to go to the well, the lowest level of employment in the company. So that all these reporting lines are reviewing the people who report to them to ensure that their conduct comply with the law, comply with company policies and all that. So like I was talking about in disciplinary hearing, that yes, understandably, sometimes you have to suspend somebody to conduct disciplinary hearing. But the court has held in several cases that indefinite suspension is unlawful. In fact, in this particular yeah. case, the company suspended somebody for two years. Explain to me what kind of disciplinary hearing that you do, that you're doing, that I you suspend understand. somebody without pay for two years. And what now happens is that the position of the law on that aspect is that the period of the suspension up to the period that the court makes a decision, the employee is still um, is considered an employee of that company. So if you check out all the case laws and decisions of the court on that matter, what the court normally um does at the time it is delivering judgment is that it will award the employee's salary from the date of the suspension, even if the matter ends three years later, to the dates of judgment. And then you now have to pay all of that. So those are some of the things that you have to consider. Of course, there is the issue of sexual harassment, which <laughs> we find in a lot of organizations very unfortunately, because there is this, there is this, so there is this particular case where be an, an employer, sorry, a staff, like I was talking about reviewing your senior officers as well, where a senior officer was making advances towards a particular lady and she was turning down his advances. So he became very vindictive towards her. In fact, in one particular case, the employee was demoted, transferred as far as Kaduna and, you know, away from the company and, and also made to report with a junior officer. In fact, in another particular case where the um, the employee was being, you know, wooed by a senior officer. And when the employee rejected his advances and maybe four days before her wedding, she brought an invitation card, announced they invited everybody to her wedding. Of course, he was so offended by that act that he called the lady and told her to resign. For no reason, you know. And at the end of the day, 
the employee sued. And of course, in this particular case, where the employee was asked to resign, the court awarded as much as seven million. In fact, now the damages that are being awarded by the court increases by the day. So finally, because we're running out of time, one important yeah. thing that also needs to be considered is the manner in which you end employment relationship. It is very important. Mm -hmm. Now, every employment contract provides for termination notice periods. Mm -hmm. You must comply with those notice periods because the law provides for that. First of all, you already know. You must always consider when you're inserting it in your contract because sometimes you find people insert things like three months notice period, six months notice period. And then when it is down time, maybe the employment relationship has gone sour. And then you, you, you cannot stand looking at the face of the person. You have to cough out salary in lieu of notice to pay the person. So you have to consider these factors when you're setting up. Now, the normal intention behind those long notice periods is to aid ease of handover, maybe employ somebody before the person who is leaving, you know, goes out and allow the new person to, you know, get control to understand and the processes of the company. I'm sorry. Yeah. The processes of the company before um they leave so but then you find that most cases they, where, where the relationship goes out uh, you're stuck with that person so now what the law also requires that if you're going to terminate somebody without notice so it, it's either you let the person to wait out their entire notice period or you pay salary in lieu of notice but what the law requires is that if you're going to terminate an employment without with um with immediate effect you are required to pay the person's salary in lieu of notice and benefit on that particular day. It has to be paid contemporaneously with the termination. Otherwise, the court will be held. We hold it to be an um, wrongful termination. Of course, there are several other exit terms that are in the employment contract that one must comply with. Then, in drafting your non-disclosure agreement, please make sure that you have a clause that states that it survives the employment relationship. Because I see some people, some people make mistakes and state things like, you know, the employee at the, uh, parties will have the right to terminate the non-disclosure non agreement at any time. Uh -huh, if I leave, I can just terminate the non-disclosure agreement and disclose everything by myself. So you have to make sure that it survives the employment relationship such that even when the employee is gone, your confidential information is protected. Then, of course, there are matters relating to return of company properties. You have to address those ones either in your contract of employment or your handbook. The there is something that you see some companies do where they accept people's resignation or reject people's resignation. Please understand that resignation is not accepting a resignation is not even an option. You can don't have a right to reject a resignation because what the law will consider, the government will consider it at all as forced labor. So what it now means is that if, for instance, you had any grounds with the employee or maybe there's a misconduct of any nature during the employment relationship, it means that you have a responsibility to raise it immediately and start disciplinary processes immediately, not after the person resigns. Then you will not want to start disciplinary procedure. To be fair, some employees during their notice period, they really start to misbehave. Of course, at that point, you are still allowed to take action against that employee for those misconducts that take place during the notice period. But you must make sure that you comply with the provisions of the disciplinary procedure laid down in the employee handbook. So um, then there are other things, like I mentioned, the regulatory notices that one must always consider, like this um, the, for the financial industry, where the CBN requires financial institutions, banks and financial institutions to um, submit the names of every any employee whose employment was terminated for reason of fraud, dishonesty, um, corruption, and the rest of them. But you know the funny thing? This um, regulatory notice exists for a while. But then you found the CBN was receiving a lot of um, appeals from employees asking them to remove their name because the conditions on which their employment was terminated was um, the conditions were not fair. They were not given fair hearing. For that reason, the CBN had to go back and issue another guideline to say that before you bring anybody's name to me, the condition, you have to make sure that you comply with the requirement of fair hearing as required by law or your disciplinary procedures in your handbook. So that by the time you're coming to even the court or even the CBN as it were, you'll be able to show that there was a process and the process was objective. You know, And then based on that, and you know a proper consideration of the entire circumstances re um, revolving around the misconduct you made this decision for example in one particular case 
um, a, an employee, a senior officer made an allegation against an employee. And then in the disciplinary proceeding that's, um, that's followed, the accuser sat as one of the panelists that took the disciplinary process. Of course, you cannot be a judge in your own case. So the court obviously rejected that decision and awarded damages against the company. So that is where this issue of objectivity comes in. So to, in terms of collaboration, you know, the one thing I will say, and I will say this because one issue that you find that a lot of HR persons have is that they are not given the independence that they need to objectively manage human resources. Now, of course, some human resource professionals, no offense, um, also need to, um, you know, learn a couple of things. You know, there are people who sometimes move outside the contract of employment or even the handbook to take certain steps that end up because uh, so for instance the first case that i explained when i started this presentation the the human resource officer was the person who, who of course signed the employment contract human resource officer was the same person who did the rejection now in the in this entire um if, uh, circumstance what should have happened is that this human resource person should have been in a position to advise the company that this is not um the right thing to do and that is where collaboration between the human resource person and the lawyers come in. It is very important because the, uh, what the court categorizes as unfair labor practice or best practices, it evolves by the day. So of course you need a lawyer who is constantly in tune with the new regulations, who is constantly in tune with the new case laws or the processes or standards that is being laid down by the court um, you know, frequently. So that way, the human resource person and the lawyer collaborate together to be able to ensure that the best practices are enforced in the company. And like I said before, even the management level should understand that human resource persons are not tools that you just want to give instruction, fire that person, give this person a query. Mm -hmm. There are processes. If you don't want somebody that will give you objective opinion, then don't hire anyone at all and face the music. So that's when you're making decisions that will end up exposing the company to risk, you will know that you made it by yourself. So there is no point in employing somebody that you're going to just give instruction to do the wrong thing. Exactly. So, exactly. so that is actually another thing that is very important. So finally, compliance is a very important aspect in managing employment relationship. And like I talked about, the cuts across regulations, laws, case law, and all that. If you do not comply, there are several things that can happen, especially for startups. Now, you hear that some startups startups are trying to raise. In fact, this is a very tough period for a lot of startups, tech startups especially, you know, trying to raise funds and all that. And the last thing you want, we know what happened last year with Horrible Bosses hashtag and all that, and names were flying left and right. So the last thing you want is the reputational damage that comes with the breach of minor employment contract obligations you know and then also you also realize that sometimes like i said compliance is the longer you take or the more you breach the worse it gets it gets so you see like i mentioned earlier how you find that some, some management made certain decisions and then instruct the hr person to just take certain steps that do not comply with the contract of employment or you see arguments that you know we don't want to comply with um the provisions of the contract let's think let's think about it for a minute the provision of the employment contract says if you fire an employee, let's say, for instance, the contract says pay the employees one month salary in lieu of notice. Uh -huh. Let's say the employee's salary is, let's say it's big, one million naira. Okay. You now refuse to pay the employees an um, employment contract and refuse to pay the employees benefits and tell them to get out and leave your company. So as at the moment that you're, that, at that time, this damage is one million naira, then the employee will sue. And then all the, the breach of contract and all that goes out and becomes public information. That's reputational damage. Then you have to engage a lawyer to represent you. Though that has already exceeded the 1 million naira that you are trying to fight over in the first place. Then by the time the court will now make a particular decision against the company, the court will now award damages on top. So by the time you're looking at it, it will now be better for you to have complied with the provisions of the law. Because sometimes I look at evil companies and look at certain disputes and I'm like, you know what? It's not worth it. Just set it. it. Just ah. try and resolve it amicably. And that is why I even recommend for people to have grievance procedures in their handbook or in their uh, grievance procedure policy. 
that allows employees to go through a grievance process to ensure that any dispute that or any grievance that arises in the course of the employment is addressed on time before it blows out of proportion. So, of course, in addition to litigation, you're looking at the um, issues of operational risks because it really takes a small thing for you to find that, you know, a lot of employees are leaving. It, it can be one manager that is just moving his or her own way and frustrating every other employee. And before you know it, you're losing a lot of key employees. Your operations are breaking down and you're now facing operation risks. You're facing contractual risks. You know, and you're not able to meet up with the terms of your contract. So those are things that you need to manage on time and ensure that they do not, you don't even get to that stage. Because at that point, when you're even looking at operational risk and contractual risk, you are moving out of the sphere of employment and your obligation is extending to third parties as well. So those are things that you need to ensure that you manage properly. And that's why I was talking about having, instead of having exit counseling, you're having counseling or those discussions in the course of the employment so that you ensure that you rectify those things. So, I am um, well, in addition to litigation and all that, I mean, there's also regulatory sanctions that come from non compliance. Of course, people can resign and say, Oh, you never reached my pension. They'll go and file a, um, a petition with the pension commission. And then, before you know it, they're coming to inspect your company to review your documents and the rest of them. So, I think I will stop here so that I don't um, take up too much time. Wow. I have barely scratched the surface, but there is so much to cover in terms of employment compliance. Mm -hmm that the earlier you involve your human resources person and your lawyer and start to look at this employment compliance requirements, mm -hmm. the better for you, especially as a startup, because investors will not come to a company that is all over the place. In fact, in reviewing mm -hmm. your documents, they somehow want to, they will even want to see your compliance levels. They want to see um, maybe your compliance with government regulations and the rest of them. And some of them will also even Google your company to see if there are any, you know, bad news or any bad information out there. Believe it or not, talent is scarce. And even people now, um, employees now, when they receive offers or they want to interview with certain startups, they even go ahead to go and ask other people, have you heard about this company? And there are sometimes, in fact, even I have heard it, people will say, ah, please don't go there. Don't go there. So at that time, you're looking at people, people that you want to employ that could actually add value to your company are actually avoiding your company. And you're ending up with, you know, the, what you early, the crumbs, really. No offense yeah. to anybody, but, you know, you don't get the best of the people that you, you can because your employment practices are not in yeah. place. They are not, you know, you're not adopting best practices that are required by law and international best practices. Thank you very much. Wow, wow, wow. I was about to say drop my drop my go. Thank you. Um so in one <laughs> breath in one breath you have answered about four questions, right? And thank you so much because you know we're gradually tripping down today. We definitely cannot finish everything. This is like this is like let, just let's put this in your mouth and taste it. Because definitely in fact, um somebody was saying that we need to have another session and I think it's very important, right? We are so out of time. You've answered the question on the need for HR professionals and lawyers to collaborate. And also something you said, very important, it's not enough for you to employ people and start giving them instructions, like telling them, query this person, do this person. Because I have encountered situations where you're just giving instructions, right? You don't even want to know what the law is. You just feel a certain way and you give that instruction. And because you are paying them, they have to do what you say. Exactly. Right? So there has to be, I feel like exactly. there has to be a check and balance, right? Between, because I see that all mm -hmm. the time, especially in some startups where somebody just unilaterally fires or unilaterally just discountenances an agreement. And you know, we had some of that in you know some of the big companies. I don't want to mention names, right? That literally had issues. You promise this person this particular amount of shares, and you know, anyways, let's not yes. let's not drag any right. Right. Then also, you of address course. the issue about <laughs> um compliance risks and legal disputes that you could face if you don't you know, pay attention to some of these things. You've also talked about, you know, being able to manage mm -hmm. the post-employment relationship. And I think it's very important that you've mm -hmm. noted that there is there are three stages of this employment relationship, the pre, the during, the post. So before you start Absolutely. these things, you know, you definitely have to pay attention to this. So thank you so much. Um, so let's go to questions. Uh, we have quite a couple of questions here. Okay. And after those questions, we'll definitely round up because, you know, you've literally done so much. Thank you so much, um, Chitong. This is so good. Of course. So, yeah. Um, I, there's someone... So I'm going to put the comments live here. And then it says, what 
Uh, so you said, what are some disciplinary laws or regulations that regulate, okay, what laws or regulations regulate disciplinary actions by organizations? I think that was the question that was mentioned. So very, very brief, like one second or two seconds. So talking about some of the okay. laws that, are there any laws, I think that's what she's asking. Are there any laws that regulate disciplinary actions? Of course, I think so, but maybe you could share that with us. So what 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 the I, I would say there is no specific law that outlines what you will consider disciplinary what you consider misconduct. However, what you are expected to do, and that is why the the law gave companies free hand in that to that extent, is that you are you now have the opportunity to define actions. Of course, with fairness in mind, you cannot define things that are not related to performance and the rest of them. Or conduct to define actions that that if committed or if done by employees would amount to a misconduct. Now there are certain things. So it's at that point that you start looking at different regulations. Now you start looking at the data protection regulation because you you know that if an employee mismanages data, your employer or your company is likely to be exposed to sanctions and breaches. You know and and so those things, you now want to outline them in your handbook to say that if you do this, sanctions might follow. Then you look at several other laws like anti-money laundering laws. So and maybe certain um, regulations laid down by the industry in which you practice. So what you do is that you adopt all these things and outline them as part of the things that will constitute misconduct in your company. And this is very important because... If you do not define misconduct in your company, then you cannot sanction an employee for it. So, for example, if you don't have any specific dress code in your company or you don't have any, um, any regulation in your company that says that I cannot have tattoos on my hands or my face, and then I tattoo my face and come to work, you can't sack me because there is nothing in your documents that stated that it is a misconduct. So what you now need to do is to look at... So, but the handbook really, it's a continuous document because it is sometimes yeah. there are things that employees do that even you will scream, like, how did this person even do this? And at that point, you realize that this thing was not covered in your handbook. At that point, you now need to go back to go and include it in your handbook. But for every time you update the handbook, you have to make sure that the employees have it because you cannot update it and keep it to yourself. It is not your personal document. The people who you are regulating need to know the provisions of the handbook and what it is that you are really trying to prevent them from doing. Of course, you don't. You should not be excessive because it has to be fair. But then you can cover all this in your documents. You have the freedom to cover it. So then you can adopt regulations that apply to your industry to also make sure that you cover as much information as possible. And it's also important to highlight the sanctions that you can um, take. For example, you cannot suspend an employee without pay if it is not provided in your handbook. The court will completely mm. reject it. So those are some of the things that you need to cover. So you need mm. to have a robust disciplinary procedure made, procedure, and then a list of misconducts and the sanctions that follow. Thanks. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much. So that question has been answered. We have some more comments here. There's a lot of questions, guys, and I'm not sure we can take all, but um, some, I'm going to just give priority to some other questions. So Dada asks, at MVP stage, so when you are still at your MVP stage and building, um, it's a very basic question. Mm. Are employees' laws necessary to adhere to? So all these laws that you are dealing with and all that, this is something that you need to adhere to. My answer is yes. I don't know what yours, so that we can move to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, is, it is yes, but it's qualified. For instance, okay. Um, there are certain requirements that are triggered by certain actions. If you don't have employees, you can't, you don't, you're not required to remit pension, of course. If you don't have um, a specific number of employees for certain laws, you don't need to comply with them. So you might need to now look at what the law provides because sometimes for some companies you find that at the start, at the beginning, you just have founders who are not really employees and not earning salary. So you don't really need to make any deduction at that particular stage. So, but if there are certain things that trigger certain things. So there are things that is like when you have company and corporate compliance as well, 
there is you have different um different levels in which certain regulations comply to you so if you if you don't have employees pension doesn't apply even for pension there is even a number of employees that you need to have before you start remitting of course i can't do or explain all of that in no, this session, but no, no, you no, now see, have you, to you look at to you, they should do uh, i will send you a voice no problem <laughs> <laughs> So, so yes, so it, it depends. So that's why you have to work with a lawyer as early as possible to advise you on what applies to you. And even if they tell you, you also need to be aware and conscious of when that situation will change or where a change in your, in your company processes or in the number of employees can trigger that obligation um, for your company as well so that you don't realize it down the line, maybe years later as you're seeing that your liabilities are running into millions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So this is the mm -hmm. comment again. Um, you said something about termination of employment, and uh, so she said. Yes. It was a, it was, it's a comment that like, I choose to interpret it as a question. She said some contract states that immediate termination is permissible. Um, is that true? And is is that how it works, right? And is it legal for you to just say we can terminate and then nothing? You've already, I think you've already answered that question, but just a one liner from you. Yes. So, of course, because of time, I, I, I didn't really go into the details of the of termination. Yes, the law allows you to. So most contracts, it is either you terminate with notice or you terminate without notice. If you terminate without notice, then you have to pay the salary in lieu of notice. So if you're required to make if you're required to make to give one month notice and you decide to terminate without notice, then you have to pay that one month salary immediately you are terminating with immediate effect. Most importantly, because we're talking about unlawful labor practices, the court has looked at the sensitivity of employment relationship and the inequality in bargaining power between the employer and the employee and has now said that for you to terminate the employment of an employee, there has to be, you have to give a justifiable reason. Now, that justifiable reason now, has to be a reason that if the court looks at it, the court can say it makes sense. So, for instance, if you say, I'm terminating this employee because the employee engaged in a, dis in, in a form of misconduct, then the court will ask questions like, did you go through the disciplinary process? If you say you want to terminate the employee on performance basis, the court will ask you, where is the proof of performance appraisal? Now, the reason the court has now required for this reason is so that it can have the opportunity to interrogate the reason and prevent excesses and abuses in the disengagement of employees. So the law does not prevent anybody from firing. It's just have a good reason that you can prove. In fact, in one particular case, the court, the, the company said that the reason it terminated the, employee, the, the employment of the employees because it does not have money anymore. The court was like, fine, it's a good reason, but you need to show me your financial statements. I need to see that you do not have that money and you are making loss and you're running out because I cannot look at your statements and be seeing profits of hundreds of millions and you say you do not have money and that's why you said you have the So the reason has to be justifiable and, you know, and that's even that if a reasonable person is reviewing it, it makes sense. So in addition to the right to terminate, even with immediate effect, there has to be a justifiable reason. Come on, drop mic, boom. Thank you, thank you so much for that for that answer. So yeah, our last yeah. question, and I'm yeah, so yeah. sorry, everyone, we can't take more questions. I see a lot of comments pouring in. In fact, some of the members of the audience are already answering the questions of other persons. So I think it's very, very good. Thank you so much. The last question before we go to final comments and of course final thoughts before we go. So Kufre asks, and this is from LinkedIn, says, please pre-employment. Right, so maybe can pre can pre employment rights be enforced in court by an employee seeing that a letter of offer has not yet been issued? So when you say so that question is maybe discussions that were prior to um yeah. can it be enforced in court? Very simply put. Is it possible? Okay, so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so what 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 the court really does is to interpret different circumstances based on the peculiar facts of each case. So yes, even if an employment letter has not been issued to an employee, 
if your reason of rejection is based on certain or maybe certain steps that you take prior to that issuance of the letter is considered unlawful or wrongful, let's say, for instance, discrimination or abuse of um, uh, confidential information or abuse of data protection rights, then, of course, the employee can take actions against you. The employee cannot enforce employment, certain employment rights. Of course, the employee cannot say, ah, you pay your employee salary, so you have to pay me salary. No. What the law is trying to say that before the employment con um, commences, the employee has rights. Sorry, the individual has rights. And you have to respect those rights. Even And the reason for that is to ensure that parties continue to act fairly, even up to the point where they sign the employment contract. So it will depend on the circumstances. So if you're rejecting somebody based on, or maybe before the, the before the um, the you issue a letter of employment, it is obvious that your the reason that you do not proceed is based on discrimination. You can be sued. If the person wins, mm. you pay damages. So that's why people need to be very careful, even at the point of um, you know um, a recruitment where they send the offer letter. I'm sorry. Yeah. Having answered that question, I just wanted to address one thing that I saw in the comments um, regarding the somebody asking question regarding devices. So I, I, I think maybe I didn't address it properly um, in, when I was talking about policy, but there is a policy you call a device management policy. And what that policy does is to provide the conditions or how employees are required. So first of all, the device acknowledgement form, what it does is really to um, let the employee note down the, um, the devices that they have received from the company, the conditions in which they have received. Because sometimes you see that companies provide um, devices that are not brand new. So obviously, over time, wear and tear, they're spoiled. So you cannot say when you give an employee a defective device or an employee a uh, device that is already poor. If at the time it happens that the device, um, you know, dies, really, you, you cannot tell the employee that the employee has to bear certain responsibilities. So what the device managing, management policy does is that it sets out the responsibilities of the employee in respect of that device. So how they are required to manage it. And if they lose it due to negligence, these things are purchased with money. They're expensive devices, many of them. So you need to be employee to know that these things are expensive. And if you lose it due to your own negligence or carelessness, then you will be required to contribute a percentage. Of course, you have to address how you go through these processes in the policy as well. So that is the device management policy and the device acknowledgement form. They all tend to go hand in hand. I just wanted to clarify that bit. Thank you for that. And thank you for giving that clarity. So, yeah, finally, um, I was, I, I'm so glad that, you know, we really had this session. And I feel like there's so much more to learn. There's so much that you have mentioned. There's so much you've spoken about. We have a lot of persons who are still here, and you've said so much. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm just going to drop this because I think it's an important point to note, which is the last thing. I promise it's the last. Must there be a notice period? <laughs> this was asked, um, yeah, must there be a notice period? This is by Oliver Fumilayo. So I'm, I'm sure she's, she's learning this. And thank you, Penel, for that um, interesting insight that uh, you dropped, and which will lead to the last question earlier. So, yeah, quickly, must there be a notice Yes, there has to be. There has to be. Yes, the law. Women, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so there has to be a notice period, especially because you know some people <laughs> tend to consider things only when it benefits them. So you have to consider certain things from different angles. One of the reasons that you really need notice period is to allow you make arrangements for the replacement of the person who is leaving. And that is why the law said, okay, fine. If you say you don't want to give the notice period, just pay the money and be on your way. And that's why I said it is usually not advisable. If you are a company that is likely to prefer for people to leave immediately, because some companies do it. Some companies tend to prefer that if an employee resigns, that you know they just they they drop their equipment and all that. There is nothing wrong with that, but you have to ensure that you pay for that notice period. Because sometimes people do it for reasons to like protection of their, you know, their data, their IP, their information, because it's resignation period. The employee is probably at that point copying certain things, accessing certain information that you feel they're already leaving. There is no need for them to know this. But what you have to do is to comply with that period. Because if you're asking the person to waive the notice period, then you have to pay the person for the notice period as well. So it is either you give the notice or 
you um, give, you pay the salary in lieu of notice. But what also people do in terms of probation, because like I said, probation is a period for the company and the employee to review themselves and see if they want to continue. So for that particular period, you should insert maybe lower notice period for termination. So that in case you want to disengage the employee, you will not spend time giving a law. So what a lot of companies do is that if, for instance, their standard notice period is one month, but for a professional period, they do something like two weeks. So that if both parties want to terminate, they say, fine, okay, we are going to end this employment. If during the, after terminate, after review, and we're not fit to work together, we will give two, two weeks notice period, and that works. So, but the most important thing is that they have to be part of your contract. But in terms of notice, mm. it's necessary. The law requires it. Thank you. And that, that's on period. The law requires it. So thank you so much, Chisum. Yeah. I think that with everything you've said, I think it leaves a lot of things for us to discuss, a lot of things to talk about, a lot of things to manage, a lot of things to notice. So very, very important. Make sure that if you're on this call, you're listening in, you go back watch from the beginning of this session and ensure that you are complying and you know what the law says about your business, you know what the law says about your startup, you know the employment laws because literally if you are planning to go from a startup to a scale-up, then understand that it's not a one-day job, right? You can literally be disqualified from receiving grants, funding, all sorts of privileges and access points if you are, your house is not in order, right? And I think that's my final thought tonight exactly. before as we close that it's important for you to put your house in order and ensure that you get a lot of help, professional help. I will end again and say this, legal expense <laughs> or legal services is not a nice to have. We are not an mm -hmm. expense that we can keep it. You need qualified lawyers, professionals that understand the industry because at the end of the day, what you will most likely gain will so, be so much more than what you will lose if you don't comply. Those are my final thoughts. Chito, let's have your final thoughts before we wrap this up. Well, I, I think you've probably covered everything. Um, the key to compliance, really, it, it all ends uh, in one, one sentence. Do the right thing. That's all. You already know. A lot of people already know what to do. Just do it. It costs you more not to comply than what it will cost you to comply. So that small... Um, compliance that of course compliance will always it, it requires funds a lot of them require funds now for other things like uh, employment documents and all that those ones some of them are even free so consider the consequences of non-compliance and consider what you tend to gain from compliance and yeah. you know doing the right thing will always save you so much stress and so much risk so yeah. i think i, I will end on that note but do I still want to do startup? I make sure I want to build a startup. <laughs> well, yes, there are successful startups out there. So yes, start, I, and I will say, don't be overwhelmed. Take it one day at a time. Have a roadmap. At least get knowledge. And I think with knowledge, you know, it will be easy for you to pick your battles. Choose your battles wisely, and you know, start and begin with yeah. the end in mind. So with that, guys, we've come to the end of this series. God, I'm so excited. Thank you so much, Isom. You. You literally need to come back. You need to come back and speak to us. <laughs> maybe you do a master. You do a master class with us. Maybe a paid one, right? Hopefully a paid one, right? Because this value that you've given to us tonight, a lot of people don't know this, and I'm so happy that this is recorded, so everybody can always go back and watch this. Um, I'm sure people can connect Absolutely. with you. I, your your full names are what they are on LinkedIn, if I'm correct. So guys, if you have any more yeah. questions, please go into Chisholm. Uh, DM and I'm sure he will inv invoice you accordingly, right? I was privileged you to know. bring him out this evening <laughs> for free. <laughs> but right, guys, thank you so much uh, for being here. Um, I really appreciate the comments. Yeah. If you're here, please drop the comment and you know just appreciate our speaker. Thank you, Chisum. I'm so excited. I know that you're doing brilliant work, and my wish is that you know you keep doing the amazing things that you do. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank um, you. We're gonna round up in next <clears throat> two seconds. But thank you for being here from YouTube, from LinkedIn. I love the engagement. I love the energy. See you next in our next series. It's going to be very interesting. We have a very interesting topic that I know we all will be 
very very excited to listen to but without any further ado i wish you a very pleasant evening have a very pleasant night and have an amazing weekend and of course a week after so thank you so much for being here thank you Emeka, for your amazing words thank you Emeka. <laughs> uh i'm very very grateful all right guys have a good one Chisum, thank you so much have a very very pleasant evening and i wish you all the best bye all right all right bye everyone